Well, hello, Faithful Politics listeners and watchers. If you're joining us on YouTube, this is Josh Bertram. I'm the Faithful host, and we're actually starting an experiment right now today called the Faith Roundtable, where we are going to be interviewing faith leaders, theologians, different people of different stripes to try to talk about some of the current issues in uh, faith, particularly hitting churches and, and people of faith right now. And so it's a little bit a little bit uh, of a different angle, but we did we were able to book finally Will Wright, our political host, was finally able to be on today. And uh, Will, it's good to have you. Thanks for being here. Yeah, um, it's 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 good to be be here. Thanks, uh, Josh. I'm I'm primarily here for quality control, um, just <laughs> just to make sure that uh, everything goes well. I mean, I may interject here and there, but you know. Yes, I mean he 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 definitely is our quality control guy, and uh, he's going to need it today because I actually have the privilege of having my brother, uh, Pastor John Bertram, on the show with us today. He's the pastor of Christ. Fellowship Church in Silver Spring, Maryland. He's got an MDiv from Regent University. He's planted in Charlottesville in the past and transitioned to this current position, planted a church rather, and transitioned to this current position in the fall of 2022. And they currently reside again near DC in the heart of the beast, the hornet's nest, probably maybe an hour or so from where we grew up. Something like that. John, Maybe. good to have you on the program, man. It's good to be here. Yeah, I like that I'm uh, it lumped in with theologians and faith leaders. <laughs> well, actually, I'm, I'm loaded with actually, <laughs> you know, actually, so so being that this um, will likely be our, be our flagship episode um, for the Faith Roundtable, um, I, I should let listeners um, and viewers know that this will only be on YouTube. For the time being, uh, so um, but but to your point about being on with the likes of you know all these major theologians, Bible and like translators and politicians, like they should be lucky they've been on the show with you on it. I mean, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> What's our topic? Humility, I believe. Humility, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Humility and contentment with everything we have. Well, it's so great to have you here, dude. I yep. um so one of my questions dude just to start is what's it like being in DC um or near DC yeah. when all this election crap is happening is it any different from anywhere else you've been or is it uh better or the same yeah what do you think so you're letting your your card show there a little bit with calling it election crap right <laughs> um <clears throat> yes and so what's interesting so Montgomery County is um depends on, you know, what study you look at is, is one of, if not the most diverse county in America, um, uh, where we live, it's just, it, just a huge variety of folks. And a lot of it is, um, immigration from other areas. Uh, the church I pastor, we were talking about it, uh, before air, but, um, you know, for about the hundred people who call this home, you know, 20 to 30 different countries of origin are represented here in our church. So it's a really diverse church, a lot of folks from around the world. And so because of that, um, what I like about it is it kind of forces you when you're looking at things like uh, presidential elections and the election cycle, it forces you to realize that not everyone comes at it from the same kind of point of view that you do. Um, <clears throat> it's interesting to hear like kind of outsiders and immigration immigrants view of of elections you know a lot of them come from areas where the elections mean something different it's a lot it's a lot more complicated where they're coming from and so um it it kind of forces you to really think about what you're like how you approach it because you can't just assume everyone is on the same page and understands everything the same or agrees with some of your um you know the statements that you make or or things that you would think, oh, we're, you know, we all grown up here in America would assume these things, you know, and uh, so it's it's a learning curve for me. And um, I think it's, you know, the last time I went through this, it uh, was with a church that had a significantly different demographic. And so this is, um, I'm actually looking forward to, to this being close to DC, like people are plugged into it, some you know, whose jobs or, or, 
you know, their livelihoods are connected to some of the, the results. And so, uh, yeah, it makes it for a little bit more interesting and, and kind of it, the, the, um, you know, we have a little bit more at stake for some folks here. So, uh, that's awesome, dude. So I, ha I have a list of questions and I'm hoping that some of them can just like totally confuse you and yeah. like where you won't have good answers and you'll be babbling <laughs> on. I'm th that was kind of my goal in all of this is, uh, you know, <laughs> no, I was going to yeah. ask you like if, if you're going to vote for Trump again this year, uh, but yeah. I decided yeah. not to, uh, yeah. or be on, be on his, uh, what, what part of his cabinet. Yeah. I, I've, I've heard rumors, rumors of rumors. Oh, you know, but it's, it, it is funny, man. Like, yeah, definitely. You should be a spiritual advisor. <laughs> The like, lady hey, there uh, now. What's her name again? Mm -hmm. I don't remember. She's some crazy Paula Pentecostal. White. Paula White. Paula White. I mean, I didn't mean to say that. I shouldn't have said crazy. She's a great woman of God. You know, whatever. She's awesome. It's I don't know. I never met her. <laughs> so, dude, but uh, on the more serious side, though, like, where do you feel like the Bible, like, as you're, as you're there, you're in a diverse church. Yeah. Right. You said like it's different than the previous church um, in terms of your demographics. Like, how do you feel like the Bible addresses and how can we use it to address some of the like inequalities we see mm -hmm. and people that come on both sides of this? Like some people don't think there's inequality. Some people right know that there is, um, you know, that we have gender issues. We have all sorts of political issues that come around the the word diversity what has that experience been like for you how do you feel like the bible kind of helps us yeah. navigate those things so as a pastor i'm really thankful for the bible i know that sounds stupid but I, i'm thankful for the bible because it gives me something to to go back to it's the foundation for all of these things and and one of my jobs is try to like translate what was going on like say in in first century Corinthians or Corinth and when Paul's writing the book of Corinthians and how that like translates into our our world today which there's a lot there but it takes a little bit of work to do it and so the Bible really is kind of that standard that helps us navigate you know some really complex things and for me honestly <clears throat> politics is one of those things that I think the church has to speak to I think I think um I think when I was younger I was a little bit intimidated by it I'm not super politically connected and, and in tune. And so uh, I don't really, you know, want to speak in depth about stuff I don't really understand. But the Bible talks a lot about power. It talks a lot about um, uh, the way we treat one another and the way that we uh, react and respond to authority, the way that we, uh, when we have authority, how we treat those underneath us. And, and so I think that for, for me as a, a pastor, um, it's it's really comforting to know like hey you know i can call people to a certain standard because it's not the standard that i just feel like hey this is a good standard for us to have it's the standard that we've agreed to accept as a community and i do think that um when we when we bring that standard in and kind of use it as a lens through which to understand okay how do we approach um, politics, how do we approach voting and leadership and, and the way we respond to the leaders in our communities, like, uh, it gives us kind of a common ground to, to really start the conversations and a place to get back to when the conversations really get off track. So, um, <clears throat> it, it is complicated because like a church like mine, like I, I know for a fact, we're going to have people who, um, we're going to have people who vote Republican, people who vote Democrat people who aren't allowed to vote uh, and people who um, will, will go in a different direction. So it's, it's kind of cool to be able to say, okay, I can't just like assume most of you are going one way or the other. Like we have to look at these things. Um, you know, if we're going to come in from all these different places and we're going to be unified through the message of Jesus, like what does that actually mean? It's easy to say that, but what does it actually mean? And how does the rubber hit the road in a place like politics? And um, it, it at least allows for some pretty good conversations. And even if we don't kind of come to a unified decision politically, I think we can be unified in, in where we start and kind of where we end, which is super helpful. Yeah, you know, what's 
what's weird about faith and politics is is that um you know in 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 politics we we kind of you know we have our sides we are in group out group what what have you and we're very sort of tied to that identity um and then but but i but i've seen sort of the same kind of polarization within the church yeah. um and we could even remove politics for a second about just theology so like if you take you know, LGBTQ issues or something like that, or prosperity gospel, or one of these sort of like issues that seem to come up in the church that divides. Now it seems like you add politics and, and it becomes sort of this four dimensional, like splitting of viewpoints and whatnot. Um, I mean, I mean, just, just even on this show, like I know how Josh feels about say, you know, same sex marriage. Mm -hmm. Um, and, but I don't share that view because based on my understanding of the Bible, uh, which is, you know, orders of magnitude less than someone going to school to study it, you know, <laughs> like, like, I just don't think that's an issue. You know, I'm, uh, so as a result, like I feel compelled as a Christian to really advocate for civil rights, equal rights, you know, for, for marginalized groups, because I mean, heck, I'm a black guy, right? So I'm also yeah. a marginalized group. So, so like, how do you, how do you help your church kind of wade through the political waters um, and while yeah. also sort of maintaining their, their, their faith? Yeah. I mean, so it is, it is interesting. One, I think that, um, you know, I don't want to make minor things major, but I also don't want to take major things and make them minor. And like <clears throat> my board, which I've, I've told them several times, I'm like, look guys, I'm a white male uh, from a conservative background. This is who I am. Uh, and we've talked about this stuff that I need you to tell me when I'm, um, blind to things. I need you to come up to me and, and my board is, you know, reflects my church. And, um, so we we have people from all over and different, you know, shades of skin and different, uh, socioeconomic backgrounds. And so I'm like, look, you need to tell me if I'm stepping on toes, you need to tell me if I'm, if I'm going off in a, you know, in a wrong direction because I don't want to, I don't want to miss out on those things. But I think it was Wesley who, was, who says like, um, when it comes to essentials, unity, um, non-essentials, uh, what is it? Non-essentials is, uh, oh, I'm forgetting it now. <laughs> Let's just say diversity. No. Or no. grace or, or something like, uh, yeah, yeah. It's, I it, know what you're right. saying. So it's in essentials, we're unified and not, oh, in, in non-essentials, we have grace for each other, but in all things, we're going to treat it charitably. Right. And it's this idea, like we have to figure out what the essentials are for us. And as a community, I think I have some essentials that we really hammer down on and I talk about, and I think we need to talk about what are those essentials? What are the things that we're going to, these are the lines that we're going to draw around our community. Uh, and one of them is we're going to treat each other the way that Christ calls us to treat one another. So especially with when we're disagreeing about each other, which can come up over all sorts of stuff. Like in the church, it can come over up over all sorts of stuff. But we're going to treat each other with charity no matter what. And so <clears throat> like trying to navigate that, I think, is one of the things that, you know, pastors need to do and we need to take on it. And I think we need to be honest about it, like saying, Harry, this is the way I'm coming. I'm, I'm going to do my best, like give space for disagreement give space for like pushback and, um, and, and try to try to figure out ways to navigate through this. Cause some of it, like for me, some of it's not a big deal, but for other people in our church, it is a big deal. And there's other things that are a big deal to me that people are like, Hey, I, I don't care about like, what is this a uh, issue? And like, and, and you have to kind of navigate that stuff. And for me, this is kind of an older established church. And I have a lot of people who feel like they've invested enough in this church so they can speak to what's on their hearts, which is a good thing, but it means that I have a lot of different um, opinions coming my way. And so how do we navigate that? And where do we draw the lines? Say, like, okay, this is an essential that we have to be unified here, but this is a non-essential that we can treat each other with grace and acceptance, even though we just realize, hey, we're going to come at this from a different point of view. And how do you feel like... That's really good, man. How do you feel like churches are doing in terms of allowing these kind of either diverse voices and or like having these kinds of conversations 
Yeah. Like, how do you think, you know, we're doing, I'll just get, I'll, I'll just give an example, you know, um, to just think about it. Like I've seen a lot of, I've seen a lot of different churches and people put something like pray for Israel mm, yeah, up on sure. social media. Right. Sure. And, you know, I, I'm like, yeah, like there's a, there's a Psalm, right. Pray for his, you know, pray for Jerusalem or, you know, there's some, you know, and I'm not saying that that's the context that we apply that today, what that means you have to go and look at what, you know, in context that Psalm, and I don't remember it. So I couldn't speak to it at this point, but what I'm, but what I'm saying <laughs> is that like remembering it, keep you from speaking. <laughs> Come on, man. You know, I, I don't know, man. I just, <laughs> I, I, I don't have a good answer to that one either, but I was thinking, dude, like, like, so, and, and I specifically have had conversations with people that were either like Muslim or Palestinian in origin mm -hmm. that have been hurt by, by the kind of seeming one-sidedness. And I'm not saying people shouldn't pray for Israel, right? That's yeah. not, that's not my point. My point is that like, how, how, how do you feel like churches are doing and what do you think is like a good strategy to help yeah. like churches figure this out, how to allow diverse voices in in conversation while holding to those essentials? So I think that, and I remembered what it was. Uh, it was essentials, unity, non-essentials, liberty, and in all things charity, right? And it makes- That'll it, preach. That'll preach. So here, here's, what, <laughs> here's what I think. And, and I, so I am evolving as a, like a pastor and a leader. And, um, actually one of the things that has helped me. Are is, you saying you believe in evolution, John? Yes, I do. Yeah. <laughs> Let's start talking about the 16 fundamental truths and just lose my credentials altogether. <laughs> so, um, here's, here's what I've learned as, as I've dealt with people. So when you have people that, you know, and, and have a relationship with, and then you realize they're, they're a worldview or, or think about things in a way that you used to like characterize or straw man or whatever it is. Like it helps you evolve as a, as a leader and a person. And, um, one of my favorite books is the righteous mind by Jonathan Haidt. And, um, in it, he talks about our ability to kind of see ourselves. And so all of us assume, will you assume this, Josh, you assume this, I assume that we assume that the way we see the world is an accurate reflection of reality, right? We, we think, okay, the way I see it is correct. And, and of course we have to see it that way. That's the way we're kind of put together. But, and then we look at the evidence that agrees with what, like we've, we're smart enough and, and thoughtful enough and honest enough that we look at evidence and we say, okay, what does this evidence tell to me? How do I conclude uh, the truth of reality? And then, um, but what happens is when someone has a different view of reality, uh, one of the things Jonathan Hayes says, we, we come to one of three conclusions. One, they don't, they haven't looked at the evidence like we have, because if they look like, at the evidence like we have, they would come to the conclusion we do. So they either don't have the evidence. Second thing is they're too dumb to, to realize it so that they don't have the capacity to look at the evidence Clearly. to come to the conclusion. So it's either they don't have the evidence, they're not smart enough, or they've seen the evidence they see where it points, but they want a different conclusion. So they're devious, right? And so when people disagree with us, we naturally come to one to three, three conclusions. Either they don't have enough evidence, they're too dumb to understand it, or they're devious. And the problem with that is, is it's not true. That's not true because <laughs> um, right. evidence, I think it was, I'm trying to remember the, the guy who talked, um, but evidence is subject to interpretation. Meaning the same evidence that's so compelling for you is not that compelling for someone else who's coming at it from a different direction. And that doesn't make sense to us, but none of us, like we all struggle with that. What do you mean? This is so compelling. And because naturally we put what, what agrees with us to be super compelling and what disagrees with us to be suspect or less compelling. And one thing that I've learned to do is when people say it's obviously X, Y, and Z, that's like a red flag for me because it's almost never obvious. And especially when you're disagreeing. But that's a true statement for, for when I say it, when you say it, that's a true statement. And so 
one of the things that we have to do is consciously work to get out of that loop where like, say me and Will disagree on something. So he's like, Hey, Bible teaches this. I'm fine with this. I'm like, no, it's different. And it's either like, I, I can't think, okay, Will either hasn't, doesn't know as much as I have, haven't seen the evidence that I have, isn't as smart as me, or he's devious, right? Because none of those three are really uplifting and really respecting Will as a person and seeing him really, and, and not to too spiritualize it, but really seeing the image of God in him saying like, I'm going to respect you, even though we disagree on this thing. And so um, it, it, it's hard for me, like it's hard for all of us to do it. But as I think as spiritual leaders and, and, and as a pastor, um, that is one of my jobs. One of the top jobs that I have is to say, look, the Bible and Jesus is going to offend all of us and come at the world in a different direction than we think is correct. And it's going to challenge every single one of us. And, and, and because of that, it should force us to say, just because I'm challenged here, I can't just like brush it aside and say, okay, you know, these, these things that I think are true have to be true. Like it forces us to say, okay, I can be wrong. I can be mistaken. I can be, you know, I can, the way I look at something can be correct from where I'm sitting. But when I, when I come at a different direction, th there's another way of looking at it and just kind of giving people, you know, the space to understand and be different without being either stupid, um, not educated or devious. And that's a whole stinking lot harder than it sounds. Like we're like, oh yeah, yeah, we can do this I until you have to. And then you're like, oh yeah, this is a lot harder. And I think one of the things that, that the church does well is it brings people from all different places into one space and says, okay, we look at things different, but we're going to agree on the essentials. And then, and then, you know, my friend who thinks differently, I love him. I'm invested in his life. He invests in my life. So I, I see the image of God in him clearly. So, but, but he still thinks differently about abortion or thinks differently about LGBTQ issues and like, how, how is that possible? And then actually getting in that space and it's not easy. It's not comfortable. That's why we don't do it. Yeah. You know, uh, it's, it's so, so interesting, like kind of to your point, um, I, I had somebody once tell me, or we're having a discussion about something and they're like, yeah, we live in this like post truth world or something like that, you know? And, and I was like, no, I disagree. Like the truth is a truth, right? Um, we live like in a post trust world. Um, for sure. Uh, I mean, if, if I drew, Ooh, that'll preach, dude, that'll <laughs> really preach. <laughs> if, if I drew, a, if I drew a circle on the wall and colored it in really red and then asked two people, you know, what color is that circle? And one person says red, the other person says gray. Like, like it, I mean, obviously like in my mind, I would say, well, oh, that's red, but, but I wouldn't be taking into consideration that the other person is colorblind, you know? Mm. So it's like, you could have two people look at the exact same evidence or this exact same like truth, but, um, it's, it's, you know, contingent on the colorblind person to just trust that other person <laughs> to say that yeah. it's, I know you're seeing gray, but you have to trust me that it's really red, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and, and I, and I'm curious on like with the proximity of your church to, to DC, the swamp, um, like I'd imagine there's probably going to be a day if, if it hasn't already, um, where you're going to have a congregant come up to you and say, you know, why aren't you preaching, you know, more about our commitment to vote for Trump because the Bible clearly says in Isaiah 45 that he's King Cyrus, you know, and, um, 45th president, come on, bro. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and like, you know, COVID's not real and yeah. you know, yada, yada, yada. Like, like, like how, how would you respond to a congregant that, that, so, that, 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 although it could happen here is probably not, it, uh -huh. it did happen where it was. So, and one of the things that um, <clears throat> I don't know in response to that, like one, I try to I try to understand why someone would feel that way, right? To me, automatically, and I think maybe raised, you know, Josh, the the father that we had, and you know, uh, he gray area is something we're comfortable with. Like the in betweens are something we're comfortable with. 
which is not necessarily the churches that we grew up in, but with with our father as both pastor and you know our dad, he kind of operated that way much more. And I think like I'm comfortable in the gray areas, but there are people who are really really uncomfortable there, and 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 they feel like black and white is, you know, this is clearly the way we should be going. And sometimes like it's easy for for you know me to kind of laugh at them because I feel like it's silly, but but when when you're face to face with someone you care about and they're like seriously saying some of this stuff and you're like okay how how did you get to this point and i think there's stuff there that kind of pushes them in that direction but for me like um uh, i'm i preach a series and i'm going to preach it again probably in october uh jesus and politics and um i think we have some assumptions about politics and and what makes someone uh, the different side than we are, right? So if you're a Republican, the Democrat, a Democrat, a Republican, and, and we make assumptions about who they are and, and what got them there or, and almost always those assumptions are wrong. Um, <clears throat> one of the most, the things that really shook this for me, it was in the righteous, um, the righteous mind by Jonathan Haidt, but it's also, I was, I was reading a book on, um, personality development and, and they said who you vote for, is 60% hereditary, which, which means it's, and I, I may not be using the, the term right, but it's more determined by your genes, by, by nature than it is nurture. And if you think about that, like that's an, that's an incredible stat. Like you're more, that's crazy. Yeah. And, and, and in some cases it's even higher. It, it, like, and they, they've done all these studies with, you know, twins um, who were twins who were raised in, in different types of environments, they're more likely to vote the same, right? <clears throat> and it's and it's fascinating. So there is a genetic component to how we approach life. And it makes sense because sometimes you can you can easily come up with these scenarios why at some point times in your life it's better to be conservative. And at some point in times it's better to be, you know, progressive. Like you can think of scenarios of when that's advantageous. And why it would serve you better. And so for us to say, no, it's better to be progressive or no, it's better to be conservative. It, it's almost always circumstantially driven. But to say, no, this is the broad brush in which I'm going to paint everything is um, not healthy for us. So it comes down to the fact that I think we need people who see things from both perspectives. A healthy nation and a healthy community will be one that's not dominated by one or the other, but we have that healthy tension, right? It's not a problem that, you know, if you're if you're a progressive, conservatives aren't a problem that need to be solved, right? They're a tension that needs to be managed. That's the Andy Stanley thing. Like, understand that you're going to butt heads and that there's going to be times when you need to win and there's going to be times when they need to win, but we need that tension. That's what kind of keeps us in a healthy balance. And I think we've lost that. And as 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 a Christian leader, I mourn the fact that so many Christians have kind of turned their back on democratic, the Democrats and the the progressive worldview, and said, "Oh, we're going to be we're going to be all going to be you know conservative," because um, it, it creates a void, and then all of a sudden, there's no voice of Christ in those different areas, right? There's no voice of saying, "Hey, we need to like." There are different aspects here, or we do need to not treat those. We not treat half of the population as, you know, deplorables as as they are. You know, we need to not say things like that because they are our brothers and sisters. And so that's like, and as a as a pastor, and I actually lost people from my church with this, but I was like, look, we need good Republican Christians. We need good Democrat Christians. We need good independent Christians. We need good. Christians who see this way and that way, and we need these people because if we don't, then we won't hear in our churches this different perspective, and then we'll get kind of myopic, and you see kind of where that leads, where people are like, hey, Trump is, in fact, you know, a good depiction of what a man of God looks like, and you're like, you can vote for him, but but let's not let's not lose sight of what we are as a church, you know, and that's... Anyways, that's a, that's a big No, course. I mean, that it's really well said, man. And I, I, I really appreciate hearing your perspective. I know, you know, we don't get the, 
I mean, it, it, it's cool to sit down and be able to talk like this because, you know, you have family yeah. gatherings and it's just everyone gets involved. Everyone's interrupting each other. No one can really get a word in edgewise. It's like this is nice because I get to listen and really it's I, I, it's really cool to see. And for those of you who don't know, I am the younger brother, even though I have gray hair and John freaking has this lock of like red mm -hmm. that it goes blonde instead of gray. It's so disgusting. It makes me, it just makes me well, just want to. Also, I don't think you, you ever mentioned like how many siblings you actually have, like a thousand or something. Yeah. Something like that. You know, um, you know, if we, I have, I have uh, three brothers and a sister. And so John is, um, is one of my older brothers or I'm the youngest. So they're all older and I'm the youngest. And I think I'm, the gray, uh, I'm the grayest. Yeah, the gray beard. Um, gray beard is what one of our uh, yeah one YouTubers. one of our, <laughs> people refer to you as one oh, of yeah. our uh, adoring exactly. listeners. Gray beard. Yeah. yeah, gray beard the great. You know, I was thinking about this idea that comes a, a lot in like our circles, like with pastors, and it's about our religious freedom. You know, we think about we want we. You know, churches are, are enjoy uh, tax advantages. Pastors enjoy tax advantages. I mean, it's not just pastors; mosques do, and yeah. um, you know, it's 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 people in religious leadership. You know, at five hundred one c threes and things like that. But we have, you know, definitely um, the Christian churches have had these kinds of advantages in our country for a while now. And people come on different sides of that, but a lot of it comes down to separation of church and state. And it comes down to then mm -hmm. religious freedom in do we have the freedom to express our religion and which one's going to be more important, religious freedom versus civil liberties or equality, things like that. I think that's kind of a false dichotomy myself. I think sometimes that's placed there, but I can understand why people would look at it. And think this is like this is like difficult. You're yeah. you're choosing this privileged class or privileged thing in America over over others who who have not necessarily had these privileges. What what do you think? Like how does like I'm thinking about this principle of religious freedom. Mm -hmm. One, how do you feel like that? Like when you're looking at the scripture, when you're thinking about, it, I'm very thankful for religious freedom, but yeah. you know, you're looking at the, um, looking at the scriptures, like this idea of religious freedom that we have versus, uh, the commandment to love our neighbors, uh, regardless of their faith, you know, um, where do you feel like, cause there's definitely tension there, right? Yeah. Where do you feel like, <clears throat> yeah. Where do I you mean, feel so like that's at? Uh, can, can I can I be, 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 before you yeah. answer, John? Can, can I just add one more question to the end of that? Since it's in the same vein, sure, like, sure. And, and if you can answer, like, is religious freedom even biblical? Yeah, well, yeah, and it, it's a fascinating. So, like, uh, you know, there, in no in no part of the Bible does it say that you know our freedom to worship God is connected to tax benefits, right? So, um, and but another thing is like, I get it. Like, you look at these big, super rich, like pastors, and you think, oh, they shouldn't be able to get tax benefits for that. But most pastors I know are, are not on the high end of the socioeconomic scale. Like most, most of them, a lot of them kind of survive because of like these, these, you know, there's not a ton of money in pastoring local churches. Like some people, you know, do it well, but like it, for the most part, most guys don't get in it for that. Like I, I certainly didn't even realize the tax benefits of it. So, um, but I think that there are people who get super fired up about, you know, religious freedom and, uh, and, and tie it to, you know, being American. And so like losing freedoms is, is becoming less American. Like that's, that's a, that's a part of the rhetoric. And I've heard that, um, it, it's not something that really lights my fuse very much. Like I, I've never felt like I couldn't do what God's calling me to do because of some some parts that are you know the, the way that our country is set up i do think that there are things that are are concerning and and that we should we should be thoughtful in our approach but i think the rhetoric around it makes it it like muddies the water like we can't actually get down to the heart of the issues because people are just screaming at each other over stupid stuff i almost said a bad word 
over stupid stuff, you know, and, and <clears throat> like the, the, con the conversation of like, if, if I'm a believer and my, my religious convictions take me in a certain direction, how far am I allowed to do that? How far am I allowed to carry it? And, and, and honestly, biblically and kind of socially, like what is the proper way of expressing that? Cause I think that's a legit and interesting conversation and one that we can have like really good. And you can be on opposite ends of that and see, and if we're able to see the point of other people, because we don't want to allow for discrimination based upon just like, Hey, here's a, here's a free card to discriminate whoever you want, whenever you want to do it, because you're like, quote unquote, a Christian or quote unquote, a Muslim or whatever. Like that's probably not where we want to go. But we also don't want to say, Hey, you know, my Muslim neighbor, if I'm having a cookout, you need to eat this bacon cheeseburger because, and I don't care about you. Like, you want to give people space to 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 be able to navigate that. So, um, but I do think people get fired up about it, and I think there's, I think it is the the feeling of of encroachment and and the feeling of of the government sticking their nose into who and how we worship is is like a nerve that some people have that is more sensitive than others. Um, I, I, the, the separation of church and state, and I know I've listened to your shout out to your, um, heavenly homeland, right? The, <clears throat> I listened to like the separation of church and state and all the stuff that goes into that. Um, and, and, and how do we navigate that as, as believers and, and as a, as a Christian leader, right? And what's the right way of kind of navigating that? And I have at times been guilty of, I think maybe disengaging too much because it's, you know, feels like such a swamp. I don't want to get dirty in it, but I do think that we need to speak thoughtfully about it, but I don't know. In, in all of it, I think that the church should be the loudest voice of maintaining the dignity and respect for those who disagree. Like I think, and, and, and saying, Hey, you may want to take away all my freedoms, but I still see the image of God in you, whether you you know, hate me or not. Like the church needs to be a loud voice in that. And it's not always, I think sometimes the church can become, you know, the loudest voice in the wrong arenas. But I think that's also kind of an unfair um, criticism of the church as a whole, because there's a lot of really good churches doing a lot of really good things. And you just kind of hear about the worst or the biggest, right? Um, I know a lot of pastors who speak a lot, like, really strongly against like in just purely integrating your faith and your politics and just becoming a Christian national. It means that you're to be a good Christian means you're a good Republican or whatever. Like there's a lot of folks who like really speak powerfully and intelligently against that. But it seems like the loudest voices sometimes are the ones that, you know, are the only ones that get heard. But yeah, that that's so true. Especially like, you know, during COVID, I mean, yeah. Like I would say probably, you know, 99.9% .9 of the churches across America like treated COVID as a pretty serious threat. Yeah. Compliant. Basically every church that I knew honestly yeah. shut down and yeah. yeah. And, and, and yet like, you know, of course we only know about the, the churches that didn't because the media gave them yeah. like airtime, you know, and you know, that's not necessarily to bash on the media, um, maybe a little bit because I got a lot of respect for journalists. Um, but, but, but yeah, I, I think you're, I think you're totally right. And, and I'm, and I'm curious, and, and maybe this, this question could almost go to both of you because I'm the only person on the, on the call that hasn't been to seminary or, you know, took any sort of college around theology or anything like that. But, it, but, but it seems like, um, there should be a course like in all of your pastoral education that talks about things like social justice, you know, doctrine of discovery, you know, like polygenesis, you know, like, like all these issues that, that have really tarnished the reputation of Christians um, since, you know, since Christians were a thing uh, because, because when, it, whenever you talk to other folks say about Christian nationalism, where you talk to them about, you know, um, I don't know, like why Christianity is like, like when you're trying to convince somebody, Hey, Hey, Christianity is, Christianity is actually pretty cool. Jesus is actually a pretty cool, you know, like person to worship and just to follow. And then people look at you like, yeah, like the same Jesus that, 
killed all the natives, you know, <laughs> like like the same yeah. Jesus that enslaved Africans. Like, eh, I don't know about that, you know. So, so I, I'd be curious to see. Uh, maybe we can start with you first, John. Like, like what what do you learn, uh, you know, in your education to become a pastor? Sure. And uh, so, uh, Josh, I know you can speak a lot to this, but like, not all seminaries are created equal, right? They, like, in the there's a different perspective. Uh, I went to Regent, which is Pat Robertson's. Uh, he was uh, the chancellor there. And um, and while I was going to school, he came out several times and said really, really stupid things. Right. And here's the chancellor of my university saying <laughs> something I totally, completely don't agree with. Right. And I would come into class and then they would talk. We would talk for the first 15, 20 minutes, kind of walking back like, yeah, we just kind of have to accept, you know, and. You know, it's so like as a beneficiary from some of the amazing things that Pat Robinson did, right? Because Regent is a fantastic school and I I, I loved it there. Um, but it it had a kind of theological bend. It had a focus. And that's one of the reasons I, I went there. But there are, you know, there's different, um, you know, there's different seminaries that there are seminaries that focus almost primarily on. Uh, you know, kind of the social justice aspect of Christianity and, and how that needs to be expressed. Um, you know, as, as coming from a more conservative background, like I think social justice, I, one of the things that it makes me sad is like the church has allowed the, the redefinition of these terms to dictate uh, like what and how we're going to get involved. Um, I tell you what, it, it, we don't want a country that doesn't have churches in it. Uh, and you think social issues are a problem now, like churches are a, a engine behind a lot of this stuff. And you, it, as many black eyes as we get from stupid voices saying stupid things, people like churches that I've been a part of and connected to, you have a voice every week telling you, Hey, you got to not be selfish and not just look at the world for what you get out of it. You need to think about your neighbors. You need to think about the world around you. You need to think about like the way we're. You're, you're, you know, loving the world. I mean, right now in my office, I'm staring at a, you know, a, a pile of backpacks and luggage that my church brought in because we're going to give out because they're shutting down the winter shelters. And so, you know, someone around here was like, hey, we need help. And I was like, OK, I'll ask my church and said, hey, can you guys help? And all of a sudden, all these people are like, yeah, of course I can help. And it's fueled by Jesus loves me, gives to me. So I'm glad to be able to do that in return. And so. Um, so social justice is a part of the church, not just like helping those who are, who are oppressed or, or, you know, or struggling, but even like, you know, we talk about the, the being a voice for the voiceless and, and being, you know, uh, like pushing forward those who, who look and are different than you. But it, it, I think we have allowed a culture to redefine those terms sometimes and people get caught up in it. And like, we're, we're people too, man. Like, like the church is full of people. Like we're like, do you have a really good grasp with everything going on in your world? Like it's so incredibly confusing and so difficult. And, and I think it was something I get all the time where people are like, I'm not sure exactly how to navigate this. Like, I don't know how to navigate. Like, I'm not sure what the right thing to do. My, I have these lesbian neighbors who, you know, invited me over. And as a Christian, we had these conversations and I'm trying to be loving and I'm trying to, and I'm not sure what to do. And, and like, like they're people then. And, and, and I feel like in so many times, like I'm put in places where I'm like, okay, let me think through what this, how my faith helps me navigate this. But, uh, you know, if I could change anything about our world right now, I mean, you know, you have the obvious ones, but I wish like I, I would, it would be really good if we gave each other a lot more grace. Like we, we just hate one another for really stupid reasons. And, and it's not, like, there's not just one set of people that have a problem with that. Like, we all have a problem with that. And it's one of the things I get the most amens about when I'm preaching. And I'm like, look, we all come up short. Like, who in this room doesn't? Like, yes, we all come up short. And we look different, act different, vote different. And we're all knuckleheads. And we all need Jesus. And, like, I don't know. It's it's kind of where I come down in it. But, Josh, you're feel free to speak to Hate is going to hate, dude. Hate is going to hate. I mean, <laughs> my, my Palm Sunday. So. Uh, that's yeah, that's that you can, you can take that. Yeah. You can use that. Um, this, uh, this Sunday, no, no, no uh, attribution needed. It's all good. You know, I, 
you know, to answer your question, well, I've been at three different seminaries. One of them was, I don't even know if it had a denomination associated with it. If it did, I don't know what it was or what it is. I could look it up, I guess. We could all look it up. But Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary. And I went to Drew University, which was a Methodist seminary. And then I went to, and then I'm currently at Assemblies of God Theological Seminary, which is an Assemblies of God Seminary. And I didn't get through, right, I had limited experience um, at each of them. Uh, I probably have been in the current seminary the longest. The other two I was in a year. And I drew just about every class was, even if it was a New Testament survey class, was about social justice issues. Um, that came up pretty frequently um, in just about every class. Drew, but but one of the other sides of that, which is hard because I'm sure it's difficult to choose curriculum, but one of the other sides of that is that there wasn't a lot of in depth, um, in depth study of the scripture that I experienced. Like at 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 uh, Gordon Conwell, you had to like once you got past a certain point, you you couldn't do the Bible in English anymore. It had to be in one of the original languages. Right. So it had to be in 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 order to do that, you have to have people that are learning those languages. Right. And that takes time and that takes, you know, space on the curriculum. And so there's always trade offs that every single one of these universities are making. Right. So so if you're going to emphasize one thing, something else is going to have to be um, put to the wayside because you only have so many credits and the MDiv, for God's sakes, it's already big enough as it is. It's like 90 credit hours or more. And you get like, and then um, some of these other programs, they're all 40, you know, to 50 credit hours. Some of them are 30, but I've hardly ever, I've hardly seen a theological master's that's a, then, that isn't at least 33, 36, yeah. or almost 40 credit hours. And these are, these are big. So those, and, and compared to some of the other ones I've looked at, they're, they're big. I'm not saying there aren't other masters that are, that are so more much money after you get them. Yeah. Cool. It's just, you get, you know, you basically, you know, can be like Creflo dollar dude and take yeah, your housing allowance like on your, your Florida, uh, on your Florida <laughs> uh, house and <laughs> get your, he's got, we got to get our tax breaks, man. You know, <laughs> but I, so my point is saying all that, but in the assemblies of God, I didn't have enough. I did. All of it was very, um, like for Gordon Conwell, it was, it, it was a lot of like more foundational mm -hmm. classes. So we never got to some of those classes where it probably would have been, uh, you know, required. But again, I haven't had any core classes that were on social justice. Um, even at Drew University, I mean, the, the ethos of the university, I'm not saying they may have that now, right? I don't yeah. know. But the ethos was very much in that vein. Um, but, and again, at my experience is I drew that a lot of this idea of the authority of scripture was chipped away at. Yeah. And a lot of these things, so there's always, always trade-offs that I think that, yeah, I, at the Assemblies of God, you know, they've done, they've done well. There isn't a core one that I've had that was on that topic in particular, but I had a really great class that we talked about that the, the entire time read several books that were about marginalized people yeah. and, and situations and the poor. And it was a really compelling class and it was one on preaching to like modern audiences. And so really, they really emphasize that. Um, but it definitely is a really fascinating question, man. Cause I do think, well, to your point, like getting pastors more prepared for the actual world they're moving into, yeah, which is a world where a lot of people, um, feel differently about a lot of things. And, and you have to be like, it isn't this kind of monolithic, you know, group. Yeah. That's there, and and it's it, it, that it's going to be more important, I think, even in the future, kind of emphasizing some of that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, because it's it's almost like like imagine if I don't know, like you have a bunch of folks that have very strong feelings about the church and haven't gone to the church or have been hurt by the church, mm -hmm. and then they hear a pastor say, "Look, I get it. 
like the the uh, the church, the Christian church as a whole, does not have a very good resume that reflects the things that Jesus has told us to do. <laughs> like if Jesus were hiring for, for churches, like there are very few churches throughout history that would get a job and Jesus says, you know, cabinet or whatever. Um, and, and, and I think that'd be super powerful just to be like, Hey, I get it. Like, like this country was founded on sort of a Christian initiative that massacred like thousands of indigenous people. Like that, that was our opening salvo in, in sort of like America, you know? And so when, when people are like, this is a Christian nation, I'm like, ah, like, like, no. Cause like, like, do, do you really want to sort of marry yourself <laughs> to, to that version of Christianity? No, I think, I think you're speaking to something. So I think culture has shifted pretty significantly on this and, I think it's sometimes it's unfair and I try to think about this because it's easy for me to do, but to judge the past based on present um, sensibilities, right? Like our, our culture has shifted on this. And I think that if you, I think if you pulled like most pastors under the age of, let's say 40 or 35, and you say, how often do you speak on, on justice and, and racial reconciliation and, and some of the the uh, social issues, I think it's significantly higher, right? Than than say a generation before, and I think probably because like the the churches I grew up in were mostly middle class white. We we had middle class non white, but it was almost all middle class. And and the issues facing the middle class were a little bit different, right? And that's what they spoke to. That's what they heard. That's what they responded to. But I think you know you talk about like pastors who have been pastoring like in inner cities or in, or more socio economically depressed areas like this has been a part of what they've been talking about from the beginning and so like uh, it, i think culturally and it's probably a good thing you know that that we're we're shifting more into something where we're having to deal with these issues and um like as much as it is easy for me to like demonize those who haven't done it like i think that uh, i probably would have been right there with them. You know, like if I had been pastoring, if I was my father's age, I probably would have been the same type of pastor because that's what made sense to them. And I know my dad, like, like his heart for people is gigantic, right? Probably bigger than mine. And so I know that, that it wasn't a simply like a heart issue. Like he was dealing with what was, was coming, you know, down, like what he had to deal with. And so I think it's a good thing that we're becoming more and more aware of it. And I think as far as like the church, the, the, the country as a Christian nation, I, you know, that's a, it, that's a tricky thing. And I know that you guys deal with that all the time, but that's like a tricky thought because there is, I think no one should be more offended by the equation of America is Christianity more than Christians, right? No, my faith is so much deeper than like, I, I could say, Hey, yeah, I love America and I'm thankful that I'm here. But if Jesus calls me to be to go live in Canada or Mexico or whatever, like that is way more important to me than than my, you know, than being an American. And it's more foundational to me than being American. And I think not all, but there are a lot of Christians who feel that way. And I think that people kind of do mourn, you know, like, yeah, being a Christian is more than just supporting America and and. But at the same time, like, I don't, I don't think being a Christian means that we should, you know, you know, hate America and leave, you know, they, so there's this tension there that we have to kind of navigate. But I think culturally, as much as we want to be like, get angry at it, I think it's, it's forcing the church to re redefine itself and refine what we are actually about. And it is a good thing. Cause I, you know, I think that, um, we probably as a whole, uh, took things for granted that shouldn't have. And, and we had an opportunity to be more of the church than, than we took advantage of those opportunities. And so now we're kind of paying the bill, right. For some of that stuff. Yeah. Can I, can I ask uh, just uh, one, one more question? And this will probably be my final question, but it's actually to both of you again, that's good. It's yeah. like, I'm, I'm, I'm interviewing the Bertrams, yeah. um, <laughs> but, but assuming Trump wins again in 2024 um, and and the evangelicals um, still ardently support Trump, um, 
you know, to like the cult like degree in which I think they do now. Um, like, what do you think the church will look like? The Christian church will look like in like 50 years, you know, or, or maybe a better way to ask the question is what, what, what sort of long-term impacts does this marrying of, of Christianity to a figure like Donald Trump, like will have on, on the faith that, that all of us um, belong to. I, I mean, I think, I think that it's, it's going to be kind of a line in the sand that divides uh, churches. Uh, so like, I know that evangelicals as a whole supported Trump. I, there was, I have never heard a Republican candidate talked more poorly about by Christians who probably would end up voting for him than Trump was like by far. And so the, you know, voting for him versus, you know, give him a rubber stamp as the kind of person he is and his character, I, I think is for me, that's two different things. Cause I, and, and it'll be interesting to see, but a lot of times, like I think of people who are close to me, they voted because of, um, you know, abortion rights. They voted because of, you know, the LGBT uh, thing that they were afraid of. And I think, I don't know. I think the world that we're living in now is exactly what people were afraid of, say, 15, 20 years ago that everyone was like, oh, what are you afraid of? Why don't you just like, you know what? You know what? You think the world's going to go crazy? And now they're like, yes, that's exactly what happened. And so there's there's at least something there. We can like I don't want to just like brush all those people off. But I do think like it, in some ways, I think it's good for the church because Donald Trump is clearly not. Christian, like his, his character is clearly not Christian. He doesn't care about it. And, and so as far as like the support, I know that that's kind of weird because a lot of, especially white Christians vote, um, Republican. So, but I do think that people like, there is like this kind of strong, like, Hey, we need to be the church. And there has been kind of a movement that I hear about and talk to folks about like, Hey, we, and Trump kind of is the, is the lightning rod. It says, okay, the church needs to repent from the sin of, of nationalism and get back to being the church, being able to speak truth to power, uh, regardless of, of where that power is. But that's, I think, in, in some ways, the, it's going to create a, a dividing point, a line in the sand where you're going to have people who, who are going to divide over the issue and, and kind of focus, are we going to be a, you know, one of those churches or are we going to be a church that's focused on the message of Christ? So, Josh, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I, <clears throat> I, I think I agree with you, John. Can you believe it? That is, <laughs> I, that, that now that's the real miracle in all of this. No, I, 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 I do agree. Actually, I, I do think it's a dividing line, and I think that dividing line is going to become even more clear. And I think that churches are going to continue to have to, like, there are going to be certain churches that are going to say, you know what, we're going to continue to just focus on Jesus. We're going to try to get out of politics. I mean, it's very difficult to predict anything yeah. in terms of like how, how, how people are going to start making choices. Cause in some sense, people can be predictable as, as groups, I think, but as individuals, and then things just happen that are different. And then the, the things shift and ideas shift and culture shifts. I mean, I mean, honestly, in 2000, like I never even when when I graduated from college and part of it was my own, it was my own ignorance, but I, but I was raised in Fairfax County, Virginia, which is one of the most progressive school districts in the entire nation. And I never heard anything about gay marriage. And then within seven years, yeah, it was legalized. When, and, and what I'm saying is that there is no, no, it's not seven. It was uh, 12, 12 years. It was like a 10 year shift was the most. Yeah, I was I graduated in 2004. So, right. So, so I was thinking college 2008. So 2004, right. So it's 11, 12 years later. Right. And so you see within a decade. You know, not that it wasn't, of course, it was discussed before, but a lot of it was in very like in activists and in and, and, and more activist communities mm. and in in the academia. Right. Uh, especially in colleges um, and in the universities in America. 
but like it was not something that I really knew much about. I hadn't even hardly heard of it yeah. very much. The idea of transgender was very, very yeah. new to me. It was very like what in the world and now, right? And again, we're talking about within the span of 20 years or so, things have radically shifted in our in our community. And I don't think that it's too far-fetched to say that they could radically shift in the other direction yeah. in a way that would make all of us uncomfortable, even conservatives by today's standards uncomfortable, because I think a conservative by 10 years ago, their standard is no longer, and a lot of people, they no longer think that they're conservatives yeah. today. Yeah. And those things shift, they move. And I think that's a historical fact that you can see that things move and shift in terms of who's liberal, who's conservative, who's all this stuff. I mean, you know, we all might find ourselves like being too liberal or too conservative than the people that we thought that we were going to be uh, a part with. And so I, I don't know what's going to happen my prayer is that I, but I do know, do I do feel very confident about this is that Jesus always has like a group of people that follow him. And the yeah. church is one of those things and all of the evils that have happened. Like, and I'm thinking about your last question, Will, because the idea, again, like you had said, John, of, of judging people from the past. And it's easy to do that. And it's understandable. Because we look at it, we're like, how could they think those ways? But the, one of my favorite lines that I've heard recently um, was that the past is like a foreign country. You go back there and things are different, right? It's like this idea, like things are different. Values are different. Cultural norms are different. And we're all born into these cultures. We're trying to figure this this stuff out. And though churches... We're a driving force like in, you know, um, and doing some terrible things. Christians were also driving forces in ending slavery and in ending in, in, in some of the lead leaders on the abolition. And again, those are historical facts that you can look back and look at the kinds of people that were abolitionists and the kind of people in England that were like in the, and, and largely at the time considered evangelical and their in their sense of. Like, uh, like, and what they're pushing for. And so, and, and what their beliefs were, I mean, and, and, and so I think that we, you have like these dueling forces and the church is because the church gained so much power and because so many people like, like I'm reading this book called the secular age, you're listening to it. And the whole idea and question behind it is how did you get from 1500 yeah. where it essentially was impossible to not believe in God? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he wrote this in 2000, his name is Charles Taylor, yeah. around around the turn of the millennium, right? And uh, and he's like, uh, but now, like, it's very easy not to believe in God. Like, yeah. it's a very viable option. And we have secular humanism that essentially, in, in terms of our governmental structure in America like that, not that pol like religion hasn't been a part; it has been, of course. But like, wh where are these shifts coming from? Yeah, there it is, dude. A I'm secular age. That yeah. yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, but it's like, and and he kind of tries to trace these things through. Yeah, he does a great job. It's fascinating. And, and yeah. it's hard to understand yeah. what the heck he's talking about sometimes. But anyway, all I have to say is that like we're in the midst of monumental shifts. Yeah. And so I don't know I don't know what will happen. We have we have major things going on, but the church is always going to be a force for good even when there are certain segments of it. Um and at times there's been majority segments of it. And no. depending on the place too, right? Yeah. So we talk about the American church. Yeah. Right? But well, what you we know, know. Yeah. what we know of and 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 thinking about the church all over the world. Yeah. in the ways that people think about this. So it's very difficult, as we know, to define well, any kind of church. I and, I, and I'm good. So go ahead, John, and then I think you're, we'll close I think out. you're hitting something that's important because I think the church is like Christianity isn't good halfway. Like halfway Christianity is always squirrely and it always kind of distorts the vision of true Christianity. Right? Jesus says, like, if you want to follow me, you have to pick up your cross, die to yourself and follow me. Like you can't do that halfway. Like that doesn't work 
And one of the biggest issues the church has now and will always has always had are those who try to just kind of add it on like a trim package to a car. And where Jesus is like, no, I'm going to deconstruct the whole car and create it into something different. And like, that's the problem. Like the, the church is always Christianity doesn't work halfway. It just and And I think that it, that's one of the things that we come up against. It's not that people are too Christian. It's not like America was too Christian or whatever. It wasn't Christian enough. Like if it was going to be Christian, it needed to actually go the whole way. It had this halfway, half-baked, we're going to use Jesus to, 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 to further our own desires. And that's why it gets squirrely. That's why it's always, it's horrible. I think it was Wesley said, like, it's when you mix politics and, and, and faith, it's like mixing manure and ice cream. Like it doesn't really help the manure. Yes. Sure ruins the ice cream. Right. And this is the <laughs> problem, man. like we got to And I think as a Christian, I want the manure out of the ice cream because like, like the ice cream, like w the faith in Jesus is unbelievably powerful, but it doesn't work halfway. And so it, it is like, how do we, and I think that's one of the things that he talks about in secular age. Like it, there's so many people who, like we're at a low level of Christianity and just what they did. And I think that kind of Christianity is, is how we get some of this really bad distorted stuff. Cause I've never met a person who's just been like totally connected to laying down their life for Christ who, you know, who doesn't love their neighbor and doesn't like want to pour themselves out for their communities. And so the church doesn't need to be less Christian. It needs to be more Christian. And, 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 and I don't want to be like, hey, churches that aren't Christian need to stop pretending they are. But a little bit, I do want to say that. Like, and it's a challenge to me. Like, am I, as a pastor, am I teaching real following Jesus or just, hey, how it works for me in my life here? So I, it's a challenge, man. And and I think I go back to like the 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 people who should be most frustrated with the 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 mixing of the manure and the ice cream. Are those that are eating the ice cream, right? I mean, the, it's us, like the Christians who are saying, like, no, no, that's not Christianity. No, that's not Jesus. No, you know, build a higher wall. No, that's not like Jesus was a refugee. Like we need to like think about these things and 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 come back to what it means to actually like lay down our lives. And the problem with it is, is it's really hard, right? It's easier to be halfway Christian, to wear the cross and to 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 pray the prayer that God blesses you when you want something, you know, it's really hard to lay down our lives. And that's, it's, it's always going to be the problem in the church is like following Jesus ain't easy. And he calls us to do no. it. Like, how are we going to do this? Yeah. No, that's really good, man. So John, how can people like, uh, check out your church? Where can they find you? Are you on social media or have you just totally gotten off of it? Where, where, no, I, where can so, people check things out? Yeah. So our church, uh, Christ fellowship church, we're christfellowship.us. Um, it, our, you know, we're a place where it's kind of a smaller church with a big vision. Like it's a cool, it's a cool church actually coming into it. It was a really fascinating community. And so like, I love being a, the pastor here. I think we have a lot of like fantastic people, even for, for a church of, you know, a hundred people, it's, there's so many like dynamic and, and just awesome stories. So we're in Cloverly, uh, uh, Maryland, right outside of um, North of Silver Spring, the city, but, um, and we are on social media, but not well. So like, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of the way we roll. It will get better when I, when I hire someone under the age of 40. There you go, dude. <laughs> well, there you have it. Well, man, it's been such a, 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 a really a pleasure, honestly, John, to have you on. Look behind the and, curtain. Uh, yes, dude. And Will, thanks for joining us on no, this I one. Yeah, and uh, I thought we were just talking. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this whole thing was recorded. I don't know. Uh, but we shouldn't <laughs> give you a disclaimer. Don't sue us. Yeah, I should have said less bad words. <laughs> Yes. Well, hey, we love you guys. And, and, and until next time, keep your conversations not left or right, but up. All right, guys. We'll see you. All right, man. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. <laughs>